Do you think you found the skeleton? How would you tell people that was You first person. How would you tell them? Well, interesting question. I don't know. I don't know. I'm research on this. Hey, can you see us? Hello? We should be here. Hello. Landon? <laughs> yes, so, I'm, I'm here. I can, I can hear you. Uh, sorry about that. Fine. We had some technical difficulties on my end because I am no longer used to running this in the, uh, the VR setup. Because I'm, I'm, in, I'm in VR. Hi, everybody. Uh, so, like Hello. I said... Or, well, like you didn't hear me say, uh, of course, as you know, probably from just the title, we have Landon Curtinol here to talk to us about astronomy news, which is always fun. Landon, how are you? Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening from your friendly secular astronomer. And, uh, of course, depending upon your uh, time zone, latitude, and other factors like your attitude is whether it's morning, afternoon, or evening. So hello there, folks. And how are you doing? And it's always a pleasure to talk to a real live dinosaur. Well, today I look like an alien, so well, or well, a bit, you know, but 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 perhaps you know the dinosaurs came from life that came from you know seems Mars. unlikely, but sure, why not? <laughs> so well, I mean, over over the over the over the limit. I would, I'm not saying that dinosaurs came from outer space. Oh but, uh, well, but, you know, according to Star Trek, they went into outer space. Oh yeah, in Star Trek, there were a species of humanoid hadrosaurs that left space before the asteroid impact mm. it was strange but let's talk about real space and not fake space yes yeah, so so moving from your realm of your imagination to reality uh, we have some interesting stuff and there's been a lot of interest in a particular star in the constellation orion uh that star uh, uh, I, I pronounce it uh, Betelgeuse. Some people call it Betelgeuse. There actually are uh, four varying pronunciations depending on um, where you derive the name from. But uh, the, the actual the name um, comes from Arabic. A lot of our, in fact, a lot of our stars in the Northern Hemisphere actually have Arabic names. Um, yeah. People know that. But the traditional name for that uh, either means the the um, the armpit of Orion or the hand of Orion, and that Orion Orion is a constellation. Constellations are like you think counties in the in the sky, right? But 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 if you look at the typical, most people, if you point out Orion, they kind of get a notion of the of the they think of the shoulders, the belt, and the uh, and the legs. Some legs, yeah. Although if you're in a really dark sky, you begin to see that those are that the the, the, the that you in northern North sky, particularly in northern hemisphere, what you see is is a is a hunter with a shield and a bow, right? Or or depending on how you you're so in the southern hemisphere, however, um, uh, where you sort of see um, Orion inverted from what you're used to in the northern hemisphere, um, it looks a bit different because you know upside down or right side up, depending on whether you're Australian, um, <laughs> it it it. They they have other sort of um, asterisms, um, groups of stars like the Kingdom right. and other sorts of things. Anyway, but I am the hunter. The the has a particular uh, noted for a particular star um, in its shoulder. Uh, the the sort of the if you if you look at it, the the left hand um, uh, upper upper left shoulder or 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 hand is a particular giant star called Betelgeuse. Um, and it's opposite sort of the, the, the opposite side is, is, is a star called Rigel. That's its sort of um, right. Cross the shoulder. Yeah. The right, right leg. So, so it kind of depends upon you're looking at the left Betelgeuse at left is upper, upper left. Um, by the way, the one that's the, upper right is called Bellatrix. And it used to be that uh, Betelgeuse was noticeably brighter than Bellatrix, but it has dimmed. That's true. And actually, I've been hearing some doom and destruction predictions on the basis of this. So, 
first real question, how likely is it that Beetlejuice or Betelgeese or however we're going to pronounce it, and we don't actually have to pronounce it the same way. I, I, <laughs> no, that's fine. That's fine. Yeah, there, there are multiple exceptions. <clears throat> in right. Yes. But how likely is it that it's going to explode and kill all of us? Well, um, explode and kill all of us, the, the, that that is a pretty close to a zero. Um, explode and kill explode, any of us? Explode, explode, yes. Okay. Um, it, it, it is, it is a, it's sort of, that's sort of its fate, um, if you will. But explode now almost, certainly not, explode in uh, the next 100,000 years, pretty good. Right. So, okay. so if you're talking about if you're talking about soon on the cosmic scale of you know 13.8 some odd billion years since the Big Bang, hundred thousand years is a blip, right? It's a, right. It's, a, it's a mere fraction of this universe's post Big Bang existence. So you know, in from a from a cosmic time, it's 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 explosion is is, uh, is soon, but. Uh, from a human's point of view, um, even a long-lived uh, reptile like a dinosaur, it's uh, <laughs> you know it's 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 going to take a while. Um, so why is this? Well, well, and by the way, what do you mean by stars exploding? Um, we there there's sort of a dynamics of or the fate of really really large stars. Um, Stars are really, really large stars have sort of a, a, a fate where they start off um, fusing. Most of their action is fusing hydrogen into helium. Um, but uh, the, that isn't the uh, end of it. Once they sort of exhaust their, their, most of their hydrogen in their core, then they start fusing helium. And then they, but 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 helium uh, reaction goes faster. Um, so so instead of so like our our sun will spend roughly ten billion years fusing hydrogen to helium, and once it uses up uh, most of its hydrogen in its core, it'll it'll start to start to compact a little bit, and okay. the pressure in the core will increase to the point where helium start fusing. And then helium will run for a fairly short period of time, and then it'll just um, that it'll it will um, that thing will will finish its sort of you know fuse most of its helium in the core on the on the order of, of a couple hundred million years. Um, it, but in the meantime, it'll swell up really big because one of the things that 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 you know. As you get heavier and heavier elements fusing, they they fuse faster, and and you know, uh, if you will, nuclear uh, their nuclear reactions are really more energetic. So the star swells up. Uh, in our case of our sun, the our star will swell up to about the Earth's orbit size. Um, it's debate about whether or not Earth will be swallowed. Certainly, Mercury and Venus will be toast, uh, and 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 Earth will get uncomfortably warm, if not enveloped in the sun, but. Our stars above the mass of our sun, we call it solar mass, um, will. That's a convenient then, measurement. Yeah, solar mass. well, you know, it's, it's nice that we, that, that, that we have this star that we said that's one solar mass. Uh, <laughs> we um, do it with Earth masses too in planet size objects, yeah. don't we? Yes, yes. I mean, Earth Earth happens to be one Earth mass, and uh, uh, the Sun exactly has one, one sun mass. Earth mass. What do you know? What a coincidence! That, that's one of those things that astronomy does. We we sort of, uh, uh, as uh, as uh, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson says, you know, we call it like it is. So so our stars, the mass of our Sun, will go through their helium phase. They'll swell up, and then they'll contract again. But they won't have enough gravitational oomph. To go to the next stage, and the next stage would be fusing carbon, um, and then and then that will that will cause the star to swell up even bigger, um, and then it will. Uh, but but not our sun. Our sun just doesn't have the mass to keep going. But but Betelgeuse is a really big star. Um, in fact, its mass it's somewhere around 11.6 times the mass of our sun. It's, it's, it's a that's heavy one. Uh, yeah, that's pretty, pretty big. 
And and so it will have enough mass that when it when when it's done with its helium phase, then it will go into carbon phase and and then it'll go into the silicon phase and then it will go into its iron phase. But by that time it's 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 rapid and something really bad happens from the point of view of it being a nice uh, uh, a nice normal star. Uh, the, you get a lot of energy per, per, per fusion of turning hydrogen to helium. By the time you get to fusing iron, you're taking more, it takes more energy to fuse it than you get out of it. So instead okay. of the core, because you say, well, what is a star? Well, the star is this nuclear explosion of the core when it blows stuff out and and gravity wanted to crush it back in. Right. And 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 the, the the star is that boundary point where where it goes from 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 trans, you know, uh trans uh loosened and transparent. That is when you no longer see when you no longer can see through the star, that's what we call the edge of the star. That boundary is a spot where the where the nuclear explosion, if you will, in the core is is pushing it out and gravity is pulling it back in. So if the if the core gets to be more energetic, like it starts to go from fusing hydrogen to helium, then the explosion pushes the star out. Although on back to the point where it'll sometimes blow off the outer layer, right? That when it when it goes to one of those um new phases it'll 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 throw off the outer layer um not all the star will go but but you know a, a, a good fraction of the star will blow off into space and and in some cases you get left behind with a sort of a naked core we call it a blue call a blue uh blue straggler or blue supergiant anyway for 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 stars as massive as betelgeuse that star will go through all these cycles and in the end when it starts to get to the point where it begins to fuse um things like iron it's all over um the the fusion no longer adds energy to the star it takes away from energy it goes from what we call exothermic or or, or putting out to to endothermic taking energy in so right now you have a case where the fusion of the core is no longer supporting the star and gravity begins to crush that star and the star falls in on itself and it falls in in a spectacular uh, ends up crushing the the nuclear material to the point where the atoms all get nuclei all gets crushed into one big giant lump and it becomes so dense that it very likely will turn into a black hole so the fate of, of, of Betelgeuse is that it will end its life um, where gravity will win. and Gravity it, always wins in the end, doesn't it? But while it's doing that, when, the, <clears throat> when, it, when it's crushing the, the core down to enormous densities, um, it's going to throw off enormous amounts of particles called, called uh, you know, neutrinos. And it'll also eject stuff that's not quite next to the... Uh, to the core out into space and you get this terrific blast called a supernova um, from the brightest things that we that we can see in the universe some of the most energetic explosions are these supernovae and so it'll go supernovae really good now um don't worry about earth because um it's it's Betelgeuse is a fairly safe distance away it's what we call 700 light years it takes light which goes 300,000 kilometers a second, 186,000 miles a second, um, over 700 years to reach us. So when Betelgeuse blows, we're not in the neighborhood, but it'll look really cool in the sky. In fact, um, one of the things that happens ironically as it in our, on its way to crushing to what most likely be a black hole, um, the supernovae will give off not only lots of particles, but enormous amounts of light. And Betelgeuse, which again, if you go up to Orion and you look up at look up and it basically up its you know upper left hand star, um, you'll say, well, it's a it's a nice star. It's, it's it used to be about tenth the tenth brightest star in the sky. It's now probably about the twenty second brightest star, but still, it's a reasonably bright star. And even if you kind of know where to look for, even in in an in inner city, you can you can see if you kind of know where uh, Orion is, you can see uh, certainly. Uh, Betelgeuse and Rigel, but 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 when Betelgeuse goes supernovae, it will be 
um, probably rivaling as bright as the full moon. Um, oh, it will be will, casting shadows, huh? Yes, you'll, oh, definitely at, at night, bright enough that you can see, you will be able to see Belgies in the daytime. Because you, know, wow. you, you can see it, it, it when you got the full moon and it's near sunset or sunrise. You can you can see the full moon um, in the daytime. Oh um, yeah, you'll, yeah. You'll be able to see uh, Belgies this, and and for for weeks it will become this very very bright uh, star um, in the sky, outshining everything else. And and physicists and astronomers will get very very excited because we will get a basically a um, a front row seat of this spectacular thing called a supernovae, which is. Not only is it spectacular, but it's very critical. Um, you and I would not be here if it wasn't for uh, a couple of stars about 4.8 and 4.7 billion years ago doing the same thing. Right. They're providing the heavier elements, right? Yes. Yes. Because because not only do, would, it, would it crush and form a hole, but, but the, a lot of the star, a lot of the outer layers of the star will be ejected out into, out into space. Um, and those will be full of very very heavy uh, that we call the heavier elements most of of the universe is is hydrogen with little bits of helium um but all of but the next you know the next um, most common you know, elements like um uh, oxygen carbon so forth come from stars fusing and when you get to stuff like you know, silicon uh, in your sand, the, the calcium in your bones, the iron in your blood, those are thankfully due to the death of stars. So one thing that happens is that, that while, while Betelgeuse will um, go out in a spectacular explosion, it'll see the surrounding, uh, its surrounding space with lots of, of element, elements that to form chunky stuff that will turn into planets around other stars okay and we do have some questions from the chat uh two i believe uh we have and also if i'm missing a question that you've given just please put it in the chat and yeah we'll so let's see um from nestle 20 i have heard that the sun will leave a white dwarf made of carbon and oxygen so wouldn't the sun also fuse its atoms into oxygen not just carbon Ah, uh, yes. I mean, that, that, there, there's, there's also to be, to be, to be fair. Yes. So again, our sun doesn't have the mass to go through and crush into, to, to bear itself. So, so when our sun finishes its giant phase and fusing helium, it will shrink down, but the gravity won't have enough to really crush in anything other than just this very, very sort of hot, dense ember. And also in the sun, we have, there's, 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 um, something called a carbon, nitrogen, oxygen cycle, which is going on as well. So the end, the end result of our sun's little white dwarf will have you know, bits of carbon and oxygen. Will be some of the stuff. There'll be nitrogen in there and other other elements, but it won't have the it won't have the it won't have fused very much to to become silicon. I mean, there is a there is there is a really very really small chance that a couple of you know. Um, uh, uh, silicon atoms could be fused together, but that's not a very, it's not a very common reaction in stars like our sun, um, particularly in, in going into white dwarf sites. So it'll just, it'll just be this, this sort of smoldering ember that will um, stay around, stay hot for a long time. But, but that's a, that's a thing about, you know, also important to understand uh, in terms of age. The more massive the star, the shorter life it has. So our sun, which happens to be one solar mass, will have its really good shining moments for around 10 and a half billion years. Stars like Betelgeuse that only have 11.6 times the mass of our sun have a lifespan of probably around 9 million years. So you go from, from roughly 10 billion, one solar mass, to 11 solar masses, only 9 million years. That's radically it's shorter. Shorter the life. Yeah. And and how do we say, well, well, we think that that it'll go supernovae in maybe a hundred thousand years? Well, the age of um Betelgeuse we estimate to be only about eight to eight and a half million years. It's a fairly young star. On the other hand, it's 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 having a grand grand old party and it's gonna it's it is burning through its hydrogen fuel it's burned through it's doing helium fusing helium it's going it's going 
you know, going like gangbusters. And it probably only has somewhere around a hundred thousand years more before it ends in a supernova explosion, which will be very useful for study on earth, um, but it won't bother anyone. You know, it'll, it'll shine bright. Uh, it'll become the talk of the town for uh, weeks on end. Um, but no cause for alarm. Fact, well, that's good. Generate can, it's going to generate the kind of conditions that are necessary to seed a neighboring space with heavy elements that will form, end up forming planets and other good stuff. All right. Uh, let's see. We have a couple questions. Where's the Ceratosaurus? The Ceratosaurus is around. Don't worry. It's not. Ceratosaurus isn't gone. I just wanted to do a little space-themed avatar for the space show. So, you know. That's that's what's happening. I get a little alien kind of guy. Are, they're they're an adaptive bunch. At least right. some, some of them not so adaptive. I mean, this alien looks like a monkey with a funny shaped skull and weird skin, so I mean it's it's an unfortunately anthropocentric interpretation of an a alien. Yeah. So yeah. Well, stepping back and say that the, the facts of the matter is um Betelgeuse is going through a, a, a dimming phase and we talk about variable stars and it's dimming is, is, is quite unusual. It's, it's dimmed a lot more than we've, we've seen in, in, since we've had accurate observations of the star. Uh, but it's not uncommon for, for red super giants like this, um, star to have these sort of little, um, events. It doesn't mean that it's death is, is, is now, um, it means merely that, um, it's going through its its um, end of life throws. Okay, and when um, it does, it'll be a nice, brilliant star in the sky, but it won't bother us. All right. Let's see, uh, Landon. The sun won't die out for a long time. Oh, I'm sorry. This is from Unidentified Leviathan. Uh, the sun won't run out for a long time, right? And how do you measure that? How long a sun lives? So like, how how do you Excellent. make a measurement of that? Well. Um, we, you could do a couple of ways. Well, so so yes, the the sun's age uh, when it started fusing hydrogen probably started around four point six billion years ago, and maybe four point six five billion years somewhere around there. It has at least another six billion years of core fusing material in it, so we can calculate how much hydrogen is in in there and the rate that this core is fusing because we can see the amount of energy, so we right. can do the math and say, yeah, it's got about 6 billion years. We could also look at other stars um, that are similar in, 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 in type to our sun and look out in the universe. The nice thing about looking out in the universe is you, you can think of, it takes light longer to reach stars. You see stars um, that are, that, that started shining a lot longer ago. And so we can see what, what one solar mass stars do. And we can calculate their ages and say that, wow, you know, um, look at there, the, the, that one solar mass stars shine roughly about 10 to 10 and a half billion years. Um, the universe has been around since the Big Bang for, you know, 30.8 billion years. So we can see um, stars like our, you know, mass of our sun that's already gone through its end of life sequence as, as little right dwarfs. Um, and so, we can we can see it and we can calculate it. I guess is the the, the, the two ways to, to do that. Now, this isn't to say that there aren't things that we don't know about stars. We're learning. That's why it's called research, right? If we knew everything, it wouldn't be research. But but right. there are things we don't know as well as we'd like. And one of the things we don't know as well as like is how really massive stars like red suger giants um, operate. There's some details inside that are a bit confusing because they're kind of extreme conditions. So. Uh, uh, we we certainly have a lot to learn, particularly in its last uh, stages, uh, the stages leading up to a supernova, like what Betelgeuse will go through, are something we're very interested in watching and, and seeing. And so, when it finally happens, we'll certainly learn a lot. Not to say that 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 we don't. It's not like we don't know anything. We actually know quite a bit, but there's lots of details we'd like to get a better uh, a bird's eye view or a, let's say a front row seat to the performance. Okay. Uh, we have a question from Puffalopagus. Uh, 
Uh, Landon, have you met Sabine Hassenfelder? I believe it's Hassenfelder. I think that's it. Um, I, uh, Sabine. Uh, by the way, um, she's she's. I believe she's she just has a really good uh, YouTube channel, if I will, if I call it correctly. Um, okay. Is, if um, one of my mods can find that, guys, feel free to put uh, that in the chat. Uh, it's the same person I think we were, we're talking about. Um, she has a, a a really excellent channel that you should subscribe to. Um, one of the things that I like about People like Sabim, uh, I like about also another person, Alex Filipinko, is that their their uh, commentary, the, the way that they teach, is both accurate and is not full of weird nomenclature. Right? Um, they they both subscribe to the Feynman method of if you can't describe it simply, you know, in a simple, straightforward terms, um, you don't really understand it. So she has very accurate descriptions of astrophysics and um, are what I call cringe free. There's some people that try to dumb stuff down and they make sort of, of, of statements, which are, which are not really good analogies, not quite correct. And I kind of cringe, but, but she's one of those people that really communicates quite well. Um, if the same person we're talking about. Okay. I know now in terms of, of seeing, um, I've been at a, I, I believe I've been at a conference that she's been at, uh, but I don't know that we've ever had a conversation that maybe, you know, uh, astronomers like to stand around and, and, and have, you know, cocktails or something like that. And so I might probably might have said hi or something at some point. But you, you don't, you don't know that you've had a, a real conversation with her? Not, not, a, not anything, not anything detailed. Okay. Not anything you remember. You know. All right. But we well, were, we're a friendly, we're a friendly bunch. And again, um, there's there are some really good educators. Astronomy isn't all that cutthroat. Oh, oh yes, of course it's. Well, I think probably the problem with with astronomy, particularly the academic side, is cutthroat. Ap academic circles, um, in general, tend to be full of amateur politicians, and, <laughs> and, and and people people have arguments about whose office has more volume. Versus who has more surface area? Who is who is a better office? Is it is it is it academic pecking order? And it is your do you evaluate your office by how much stuff you can fit into it, or how much surface area you have, or how much usable surface area you have? Um, <coughs> and so so they have their their academic squabbles and fights and committees and all kinds of stuff in, in administration to deal with. And um, at least politicians, I mean people that elect an office. Um, they're they're professional in their pol politics. Uh, the academics tend to be rank amateurs. Uh, politicians, most elected politicians, understand the uh, knockdown sport of, of, of politics. Um, so as a result, um, astronomers and there's a lot of astronomers that are employed as as academicians, you know, professors and so forth, uh, have to suffer the uh, ills and fates that await a professor on endless, endless um, faculty committees and other sort of stuff. Right. But they're nice ones. And again, people like Alex Filipinko, um, a, a very, very prominent uh, uh, physics professor at Berkeley, UC Berkeley. Okay. Um, one of the most prolific. Uh, um, actually, one of he, so he's a really nice guy. His lectures, like, Ladies, are are full of useful facts, and that people go and watch his lectures, even though they understand the material, because because the way he explains things is is marvelous. Um, and so, um, I highly recommend paying attention to folks like that. Okay, uh, let's see. <clears throat> uh, again, from Nestle Twenty, uh, I was I was wondering about how the first subatomic particles, photons, quarks, bosons, whatever, formed. Did they condense out of energy and in what epoch or epoch or whatever you want to pronounce? So he's referring to models um, shortly after the Big Bang. And uh, there's the, the general models so that you had a, a, a early, early, early on in the universe. And we're talking about a very, very small fraction of a second. I mean, uh, and much, 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 much shorter than the blink of an eye. Um, the, 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 the model says that the... Um, that much of our visible universe was confined to a what we would think of today as a relatively small dense state and relatively uniform 
Um, and then, then one of the more common models is, is, is that thing went through with something called inflation and where it went and, um, you know, space, um, exponentially expanded at an enormous rate, but, but during that time there, there is uh, quantum mechanics was rearing its head and, um, yeah. the quantum mechanics, um, tends to, uh, that, that, that this allows right, it's very difficult for you to have everything in a, in a, in a pr very precise energy state. So there were, there were little fluctuations going on back then in the uh, quantum universe. Well, when the visible, our visible universe was, was, was everything was relative nearby in a dense state if something got a little bit hotter, its energy would be transferred to its neighbors or colder. And so they equalize. But when it began to inflate really fast, it became difficult for this hot spot here to transfer its energy to the colder spots there. So you end up having these hot and cold spots, these fluct any these fluctuations. And very early on, those fluctuations started um doing things. One thing that happens in extreme conditions is you have this matter energy transfer back and forth. You know, people know about the, the famous formula, Einstein's famous formula, E equals MC squared, where a little bit of matter M um, turns into a lot of energy E. Right. And, and that that C squared C is 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 sort of we call it the speed of causality or, or speed of light in a vacuum. So it's C squared is a really big number. So a tiny bit of matter turns a lot of energy. But the way we normally think of it is that this this going back and forth between energy and matter was happening freely as the universe expanded and cooled um something weird happened um the way that normally happens if you take uh if you take for example uh matter and antimatter and bring them together they they ignite each other in a, in a nice little um subatomic, subatomic explosion you get this ball of energy that ball of energy will then turn around and and produce matter again but it tends to produce equal amount of matter and antimatter. Somehow in that early universe, um, a little bit more matter um, happened to come about than, than antimatter. Because the, the, the normal thing you'd say is, well, gee, if you've got this matter turning the energy and energy and matter back and forth in very early universe, very, very high temperatures, um, all kinds of, of wonderful physics, you sh we should have had sort of pretty much equal amounts of matter and antimatter, and they would have kind of annihilated each other. Uh, uh, and we'd have just had this, this, this sea of photons, light energy around there. But that didn't happen. In fact, it turns out for some reason, we don't quite understand about one part in a million more matter was created than antimatter. So matter turned out to dominate by just a little bit. We don't understand how we don't understand why. Uh, and so it's one of the things that, that gets us really excited because something to learn. Here's, here's the thing. Yes. Science is about questions. And when, when scientists find something they don't understand, we get really excited because if we're open-minded, we're about to learn something. And so one of the cur one of the big mysteries going on right now is why is there matter in the universe? We should have had a kind of this equal balance of matter, antimatter, and most of the universe should have been just these sea of photons. There are a lot of photons out there, but if you look out in the universe and do observations, it's matter. Any antimatter that, that gets generated only has a short life before it finds some matter matter and goes poof, turns into a bunch of energy. So somewhere in that early universe, as we were talking about, a little bit more matter was created than antimatter. Um, and we think the 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 bias is basically like you got 1 million parts matter and 990,000 parts antimatter. So you buy together and that one part that, that one survives, part survives. And it's, it's, it's you and us. Um, so that's a really, it's a minor thing, but it's also quite, a, quite important. So we do things like create this, uh, the, the, the big, uh, large hydron collider at, at CERN and other accelerators to try to recreate those, those early conditions in the universe. I mean, that's one of the big things that such a, that accelerators do is they 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 will take like say a proton antiproton have them smash into each other or or protons smash into protons or or electrons and positrons lighting each other or so forth. Now they and we, they create little balls of energy. Those um, temperatures are in the form of like trillions of degrees. 
um, a trillion Kelvin, for example. And that's the kind of conditions that were there um, just a fraction of a second after the Big Bang. Because we want to see what's, what is physics like? Because those, those extreme cases, um, small effects become big. And in front of one of those small effects was, for some reason, the universe prefers matter over antimatter just slightly, which is good because otherwise you and I wouldn't be having this. Excuse we, me. So you I and I wouldn't have this, 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 well, you know, webcast and Belgies wouldn't be a star and we wouldn't be talking about it. So thank good. To, thank something. Thank physics that, that uh, matter won. Excellent I'm question. There was just a little bit of a technical problem where my mic fell. For Whistle some there? reason, I wasn't watching it, so I don't hello, know. Hello, hello. I am. Uh, Sorry about that. Chatting. The question is, do you hear me? I do hear you. Uh, it was only my microphone, hello, and hello. I am very uh, sorry about all of the horrible you... sounds that I'm sure everyone just heard. Well, well, what we say is that that mass and energy are equivalent. So particles are um, things like you know protons, electrons are um, have mass. They have what they call rest mass. Um, they also have something called relativistic mass if they're moving fast but they're if they're if they are staying still stationary relative to you the observer um they'll have a certain amount of mass certain amount of, of of heft if you will and it has to do with something called the higgs field but uh yes so so the m we talk about mass in fact it's it's quite it's quite correct to say you know a a electron has a mass of electron or it has the energy of 511 Rest energy of 511 uh, kilo electron volts. What, what does that mean? Well, if you had a if you had a spark gap where the the voltage potential between the two is 511,000 volts, you'd have the same amount of energy that the rest mass of electron has. That's what we call. So if you take two, if you take an electron and an anti electron called a positron and bring them together, they'll annihilate, and you'll get two photons of 511 kill electron volts and and you get those massive photons that they can generate pairs um those, yeah, that's, those that's quite you know, a like lot I say, of energy i said massive photon right mass energy is kind of equivalent so if you take the if you if you if you have interactions of of two photons that are at the five and eleven thousand kill electron volt energy levels you'll get electron positron pair but that's how I think that 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 E is going to sort of balance when when it happens today in our laboratory, when you create um, particles out of balls of energy, you get equal amounts of matter and antimatter, and that's why. But but we think the possibility is that 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 really high temperatures, really super super dense energy states, have Wait, hold, something inside it on. that might favor matter over energy. Can you guys not hear me right now? I can hear you now. Can you hear me on the stream? Oh, uh, let me see. Uh, pardon the echo here while I... Oh, no, there. I'm back, apparently. Okay. Okay. All right. Sorry about that, everyone. So, okay, here's the moral of the story. Never let your microphone just completely fall off the desk while you're in VR and then unplug itself. Because yeah, apparently it, that's a really bad time. Well, it has to do with gravity, right? That they that they, the microphone attracts the earth and the earth tracks so don't let the earth smash into your microphone or and, another and, and vice versa right so so because and this is talking about back to this matter energy stuff the the you know mass uh one of the things the property of mass is it has a gravitational field and so the the gravitational field of the of the microphone and the earth attract each other and they accelerated towards each other and uh, create an interaction called disconnect the microphone <laughs> well, astrophysics for microphone users. Man. All right. Well, I'm sorry about all that. That was a hassle. I'm going to try and find ways to avoid doing that ever again. Um, now, you had some other um, astronomy I, news. But I assume, I assume that there, are, there, there probably are. Um, I think there were other oh, were there? questions in, 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 the, in the queue regarding um, regarding stuff and so um we i wouldn't want to have essentially the 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 microphone incident um uh do that but but um it we think by the way that that back to 
back to the thing of, of, of Betelgeuse is a very large star, um, both in mass and in size. Um, in fact, it's, it's one of the few stars besides our sun where with really careful telescopic techniques, we can actually see it not as a point source, but as a, as a, as a, as a blob. We've actually been able to, to measure sort of the size of, of there and take really, really fuzzy pictures of, of, of a blob that is, um, that is of course, uh, Betelgeuse. Um, it's got this nice little cloud around it. Um, you should understand as well that, that, that Betelgeuse, like many stars is a variable star. It, it pulses, it has, and, and the common thing about it is that, that, that many stars, like for example, Polaris, the North star is a variable star. It, it, it changes in, in brightness once in a while. And usually the, the simple way to think of that, the most common problem is that, um, a star will become, a score will become slightly more energetic. The star will swell up. It'll, it'll, it, it, it'll move material out of that core region, which will cause the core not to be as energetic. And then the star will contract a little bit and it'll pulse back and forth. And this, that that's one of the common mechanisms for, for there. It appears that, um, there are two different, um, pulse rates of, of a Betelgeuse. It has, it, it's a, it has a variable it is a short variable cycle and a long variable cycle. Um, there is a, um, so there's a, there's a relatively short period and a long period of, of like 425 days of it going through. And, and what we think might be happening is there's a coinciding of the short period and the long period is one of the speculations happening. So, um, you know, people have been monitoring the, the, the star for there. So it has, it, they think what it has is, is a that the, the short and long period um, happen to coincide. So it has a it has a 495 day period and it has a shorter thing and the two coincide. Now other things could be happening as well. When you know, big stars like Betelgeuse are are unstable, and it could be that it had a really big outburst, right? And and, and by I mean outburst, we you know like it, it it had one of those super solar flares. And this material moves away from the surface of the, of, of the star. And now that material starts to get in the way of light from that star. So it might have had a little bit of burp. And we might be seeing material coming off of not a lot, just you know, a tiny fraction, but enough to dim it, right? And it's dimmed it to the point where it's 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 about two and a half times fainter than it normally is. But um, you know, don't don't feel so bad about it because if you took, uh, if you look at the amount of light coming off of Betelgeuse and compared it to our sun, um, Betelgeuse has a luminosity of somewhere around a hundred thousand times that of the sun. So if you captured all the light that Betelgeuse is throwing off, it, you'd have a hundred thousand times more light coming off of Betelgeuse than our sun. It's That's a cool. very, very bright, it, it, it's a brilliant star. Um, ironically, on the other hand, because it is so big that, energy is spread over a much larger surface area. So in fact, the, the surface area appears to be cooler, right? The, the, right. the surface temperature of Betelgeuse is a whopping 3,590 Kelvin, but our sun is, is 5,960 Kelvin, right? It's, 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 our sun is more, in, but it's smaller. So our sun doesn't produce the type of, of, there. But on the radius size, in, incandescent light bulbs have a higher spectrum peak than that would for black body radiation. Yeah, yeah. So, so, um, but again, it, it, um, Betelgeuse is a very large star um, in terms of its size um, uh, relative to the to the sun. It's, it's been a, Betelgeuse. It would be about a thousand times that almost a thousand times the diameter of our star. Okay, our sun. Um, so it's. It is, um, it's, it's bigger. So it's lifetime is, is quite short. We estimate the age around eight to eight and a half million years and stars of that size live somewhere between 8.1 and 8.6 million years. So could it end tomorrow in, in a supernova explosion? Yes. Um, the chances are, could it live another hundred and 200 million years will probably like not likely it's probably it's probably has somewhere around 100 million excuse me thousand hundred thousands correct 
scratch all that. Ages between eight and eight and a half million years, it probably has a hundred thousand years left. Um, and based upon what we composition is, its size, the amount of material we think is in in the left in the core. Okay. Um, uh, it has dimmed by almost a factor of two and a half, which is really unusual. And again, massive stars have their uh, have have properties that we love to study because they're kind of the extreme edges of things. And so um, I would like in my lifetime for Betel Geese to go supernovae. We'd learn a lot um, and be very safe. But but uh, it's it. By the way, um, when you talk about it being a large star and a big telescopes can see it, um, you're not going to go up at binoculars, look at it and see it, see a, see a disc. The, if that dot you see, uh, if you take a photograph, is because the atmosphere has basically blurred it from the spot. It's it has an angular diameter of maybe one fiftieth of an arc second. So you have 360 degrees in a circle. You have 60 minutes in a degree. You have 60 seconds in a minute. And Betel gives me one fiftieth of that second. So one fiftieth of a sixtieth of a sixtieth of a degree is the angular size of, of Betel gives. And your atmosphere is going to blur yeah, it there. But, but with the special place. techniques, on the ground or from space, we can actually see uh, Betel Geese is close enough that we can actually see it as a as a disc. Okay. Now Not we a have lot. a question from Taddy Boggle, who asks, uh, "Can you ask if there's a difference between dark matter and antimatter? If yes, what is the difference?" And I am pretty sure the answer is yes. Yes, the answer is yes. Um, so, so uh, antimatter is like matter except it's opposite, right? And so, if you have a electron. Um, that has a negative charge, the antimatter form electron, we call a positron, has a positive charge. Um, you have, uh, in, in the nucleus, you have a proton, right? For example, hydrogen is a proton surrounded by, hydrogen atom is a proton surrounded by electron. Well, there is a antimatter version of a proton called an antiproton. And the antiproton is having a positive charge, it's a negative charge. So to create anti-hydrogen, you take an antiproton, that's negative charge and a anti electron that is a positive charge and it forms anti hydrogen. By the way, there are you know another common particle in um, in many atoms is a neutron. And, and guess there are what? Anti neutrons. I, and they're anti neutrons. Um, and guess what charge a anti neutron has? I'm going to go with it's going to be negative, but it's also going to have the opposite spin of a normal neutron. Yeah, so so the so so a normal neutron has a charge of zero. So an antineutron also has a charge of zero, negative zero, right? But um, it turns out that things like protons are made up of smaller things called quarks, and there are these there there are three quarks that make up a proton. Well, the antiquarks make up the antiproton. The same thing. There are three quarks to make up a neutron. There's antiquarks to make up an antineutron. Anyway, so whenever you get matter and antimatter together. Um, they tend to annihilate each other, and you get that conversion to energy. That e equals mc squared is is a useful thing for an object that's not moving relative to your frame. And so, um, so that's why a lot of times, for example, in particle accelerators, we want to create these dense energy states. We want to recreate conditions very soon after the Big Bang because we want to see what does the universe do. Uh, one of the good ways is to generate some antimatter inside a particle ring and and send it down the line in a collision course with matter and the two hit it the, the you make them they can connect to each other at the detector spot and you get this spectacular ball of energy very high temperature and that energy then turns back and convinces back convinces back to matter and antimatter you get these particles flying out and interesting interactions we can understand the physics of of what happens at very very high temperatures and one of the things we're hoping to learn at cern is whether or not why is there more matter than antimatter now he had another term he asked about difference between antimatter and dark matter yes well dark matter is a very different thing um even though it has that word matter um dark matter we know the existence of dark matter because we can detect and measure a gravitational field, which um, we don't know the source of. 
So dark matter is this gravitational field that we see. And, and the assumption is that whenever you have a gravitational field, it's because you have mass someplace. Well, so we say, where is that mass? Um, we can't see it. Um, so we call it dark mass or dark matter. Now, by, 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 by dark, meaning that this, this gravitational field we think is being generated by mass somewhere, but that matter, that mass has, we've never seen it emit light in any wavelength. We've never seen it reflect light. We've never seen it absorb light. So it's not right. emitting, reflecting, or absorbing light. It seems to be completely self to all wavelengths from the from the very, very short gamma rays down to the very, very long radio waves. Um, astronomers are really, really good at detecting very, very, very faint light sources over a wide spectrum. And we've never seen this stuff right. either glow or absorb or reflect. So that's why we call it dark. So to be to be correct we don't we well first of all we don't know what dark matter is we we there is a gravitational field that we assume is being generated by some mass someplace but we don't know where that mass is and it's kind of embarrassing because it turns out on average there are six times more dark matter than there are normal matter but we might melt more if you took the energy of the dark matter that could create that excess gravitational field, it's six times more than normal matter. Take all the particles in the visible universe, all the protons, electrons, neutrinos, all the weird stuff, um, what we call normal matter, uh, dark matter sees about six times the mass or six times the energy. So there's a lot of it there. Uh, we just don't know why. Um, so there's been various theories about that, 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 that perhaps uh, gravity on, on cosmic scales works a little bit differently than in local scales. Um, there's some stealth matter that's, that's, that photons don't interact with. We don't quite know. Um, so we don't even know if, 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 if dark matter has, has antiparticles, if we presume it does, it, because we don't see dark matter and dark antimatter annihilating each other and creating energy. If we did, we would see photons and stuff coming out. So um did the inner universe have a bias towards if if dark matter is is mass of some particle some place and we don't know what it is um it obviously didn't create anti particles um in the same equal amounts because we have this dark matter hanging around um so again science is about questions and one of the questions uh, a, a very famous uh interesting character called Zwicky. Uh, he was a, um, a astrophysicist from the fine Institute of Caltech. And he started um, doing simple calculations saying, well, here's a galaxy spinning. You've seen those, those whirlpool of, of stars, those spinning mm -hmm. whirlpool of stars. And he started taking measurements and saying, well, let's see how fast this thing is spinning around. And he looked at it and said, wow, that's kind of interesting. This, this galaxy is spinning so fast, it should be flinging itself apart. Right. And so, well, maybe it is. Maybe it's, we just happen to see it there. So we started looking at clusters of galaxies that are orbiting each other. The gravitational field is 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 got each other into this cosmic dance. And you started measuring the speeds of those galaxies orbiting each other because you can measure their mass to say, well, what's and then you find that wow, this cluster of galaxies is orbiting each other so fast that it should be flinging itself apart. Maybe it just happened to be we happened to see it in the last. Fortune. So he looked at another cluster, another cluster. He kept coming in and saying, Hey, folks, um, we've got too much gravitational field here. If right. I they can't count for all everything the everything in the universe happens to be in this weird young state. Uh, then where's why is this thing? And 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 unfortunately, there's a number of people that sit there and say, Yeah, well, maybe, maybe there's black holes and you can't see the black holes at the time, right? Or you can't see the environment, the effects of the black holes. Or the people came up with excuses, right? They 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 kept saying there's like, yeah, well, maybe there's some. We don't understand the mass of a, a neutrino, so maybe there's these neutrino particles out there. There they gave us excuses, but they didn't take them incredibly seriously. And uh, he he didn't take kindly to that. He was he was known for um, uh, uh, criticizing his colleagues for not uh, paying attention to important things. It turned out. Zuki was right. Uh, 
it is a big deal. And the now the the existence of the gravitational field of stuff we call dark matter um, is 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 big, right? And in fact, you look at the mass energy equivalent of dark matter to normal matter, it's like six to one. So it's not it's not just this this esoteric thing on the side. There's a lot of it, and that that normal matter seems to be the the but we don't know what it is. Okay. And so science is about questions. It's a great question. And it's got mass. Ricky and other people like him that said, what is this? And um, we are really excited because we don't know and we're in the process of learning. Actually, um, if people are interested, my neck, my video coming out tomorrow afternoon, depending on where you are, most for all of the U.S. will be afternoon or evening. If you are in Europe, unfortunately, it'll be like the middle of the night. And I guess if you're in like... I don't know, Australia or something. It'll be yesterday morning. I don't know how that works. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or tomorrow morning, the next day, Tuesday morning. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Check out this thing about the, uh, yeah. About uh, the, so you, you have, you have this series about uh, uh, the uh, early origins of the universe and alternative theories. <laughs> well, unfortunately, so this guy is giving this talk called Big Bang Exploding the Myth. And I'm now about, oh, goodness. An hour, almost, let's see. Yeah, coming up on in like an hour and a half, maybe a little bit more worth of commentary on this. And it's really not much more, much more than half me. It's probably, you know, like 60, 64% me talking and the rest of it is this guy. Still hasn't touched on the Big Bang. Yeah. It's been, well, how did the moon yeah. form? What's What about the nebular hypothesis? Uh, how do stars form? And it's like... And and we don't know all those details. It's why it's called research. Right. And and the thing that separates science from dogma is science is about questions. Dogma is about telling you what the answers are, even if they don't know it. Right. We and, do, I believe, have some questions now that have come in. I think we have a little bit of a, of a sure back of them. So, so uh, do you want to pick one, or I can pick one off of the chat as well? What would you? Prefer? I think I'll just go mostly in order. Uh, let's see. So we got Dark Knight Apologetics, and he is asking: Is there a possibility that Beetlejuice has already gone supernova, and we just don't know it yet? I'm guessing the answer is yes, but probably not. Yeah, it's kind of guess kind of different upon. It has a tested. There's a little bit of semantics here. It has it to do with what is now, right? We you and I know that now is now. I mean, now we're having this podcast. But what does it mean to have now for something far away? Because when we see Betelgeuse and we say it's it's 700 light years away, what we're saying is that we're seeing light now that right. left the star when it was the um, the year um, the common common year uh, 1320. Right. So in 1320. Uh, light left Betelgeuse and it's arriving here now. So we see our Betelgeuse now was from light that left Betelgeuse back in 13, the year 1320. I guess we could interpret it as, and I think this is probably what Dark Knight Apologetics is probably meaning, is, is there a chance that we will see the supernova event and on Earth in the next 700 years? Well, um, given the models we have of stars, the the chances of it, we, we think it has around 100,000 years left, right? So if you say, okay. well, it's 700 years away, we're seeing it 700 years ago, so there's about a 0.07% chance that the, um, the light showing the um, supernova explosion of Betelgeuse is in transit. Okay. Again, the question becomes, what is now? See, if you were at Betelgeuse and you look back at Earth, I would see what the would 1300s. you see? Hundreds. You would you would see Earth as the year thirteen twenty in With your a really, now really good right? telescope. Yeah, yeah. You would see the environment of of, of stuff happen, right? Um, so when we say something like it's seven hundred light years away, what we're really saying is that at the time that the light left that object to come towards us it took light 700 years to get here so 
See, their now is different than our now. So if, right. if you were there, you would have a now, now, and you would see Earth as it was 700 years ago. They would not, for example, if we if we had a powerful radio transmitter, we we're broadcasting this this uh, podcast back to to Betelgeuse, They wouldn't pick up our now until 700 years in the future. Right. So so you know, if you sit there and say, okay, because some people say, well, you're looking at it in the past. Well, no, we're not seeing Betelgeuse in the past. We're seeing it now. When you look up at Orion now, you see Orion as it is in our now. Now you might say, how long did it take for those photons to get here? 700 years, in the case of Betelgeuse. But if you were at Betelgeuse looking at us now, you would see the light that left us at 30 or 1320. So it's kind of, right. it, it, our, our language is not really good at describing it. I, so if you sit there and say, well, could it mean that Betelgeuse has already gone supernova? Well, in our now, the answer is no, because right. we would be bright, right? Um, the, maybe the question to ask, you should ask is, is it possible that the photons revealing that Betelgeuse has gone supernovae are in transit between here and there? And the answer would be about a 0.7% chance. So maybe, but probably not. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, we have, oh, we're skipping down to a $20 super chat from Ben Benhoven. Thank you very much. By the way, Thank it's Ben Hoven. No, no relation. relation. No relation. Okay. <laughs> hey, hey Ben Hoven has no relatives. He has no relations. Um, or he doesn't have relations with people or something. I know. Well, but, no, he's just yes. not related to Kent Hoven. Ah, that's well, or Eric or, or Joe or, or any of the others. Or, uh, or I like to say that the, the, you can combine that group and call it, you know, Kent Ham, right? Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's, kind of a, it's kind of the super part of super position of, of Kent Hoven and, and Kent Ham. Um, right, but so yes, Ben Hoven is, is, is one of those uh, uh, energy states in between. So what is this? What is? Uh, thank you, by the way, for your super chat. What yes, is absolutely. Question? Thank you. Our question is for both Dapper and Landon. What is your favorite pizza topping? I think we'll start with Landon. Hmm. Okay. Well, um, I have a number of favorite pizza toppings. I really like the Italian. You know, so in in the in in Italy, they had these pizzas that had pesto on it, right? Mm, um, really yeah. fresh pesto on there, and and um. Uh, the type of pizzas that you get in a classical pizzeria in Italy are are somewhat different than what you might find in North America or Australia. So now, by the way, in Australia, uh, one of the better pizzas I had was a fish pizza. It had on it wonderful barramundi uh, uh, thing. It was really, really good. Um, uh, I also had another nice uh, topping uh, in in Australia of a pizza that had pineapple, as you know, mango and pineapple on it. That was really uh oh, you're going to upset some people. About half of them, <laughs> but 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 Australians do. They're they're kind of the opposite, right? They do they do things upside down, right? So well, yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> they they need to hold on to the ground above them because of, obviously, since the Earth is flat. Or gravity only goes one way because the Earth isn't flat. I don't know how it works. Allegedly, but be careful because you can't. If you if you make if you make fun if you make jokes that could be considered potentially offensive in Australia, uh, Susan will ban you for life from YouTube. So oh, well, we'll try not to do that. All that's right, what happened, um, that's what happened to me. That's that's why I can't. Oh, I can't have any nice things on YouTube. <laughs> I still have an answer. So red eye, red eye, red eye is the guy that you should blame for for me being off of uh, of, of YouTube. No, maybe Susan. No, Su blame Susan. Okay. Susan blames red eye because she was trying to protect red eyes. Um, All right. So <clears throat> for me, it's a thing that kind of varies occasionally. So um, if I'm in sort of a, it basically it depends on what kind of sauce I want. Yeah. If I want a tomato sauce, then I usually I'm gonna want some kind of it's going to be usually some kind of meat involved, like a uh, maybe like a pepperoni or a bacon or something. But then if I want like a white sauce, then I usually go for things like uh, chicken. And sometimes I'll even do things like, say, let's put some fresh greens on the pizza after it comes out of the oven 
with the chicken and the you know the melted cheese and the white sauce already on there. And that would also include things like a pesto sauce if I was going to go for a pesto yeah. sauce on the pizza. So so what you should do if you're trying to evaluate a place that serves pizza or legend thing that they led to be pizza <laughs> is you should try to um, evaluate pizza in its base form, right? It's, it's, it's fundamental, the fundamental unit of pizza. So maybe a, a, a cheese pizza or uh, Italian might call another thing. that's like a pizza margarita might be getting um, cheese, a little bit of basil, yeah. um, oregano, that sort of thing. Um, Cause it's, it's like ice cream. If the ice cream maker can't get vanilla right, there's no point in <laughs> trying chocolate or 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 mango or other uh, other fun uh, right. ice cream flavors. So um, start with the basics, and if they can do a basic thing, and this is this is important, I think uh, one of the one of the one of the failures of pizza places that are not in New York is that they you have to buy an entire pie piece of pie in order to yeah. determine it's not good whereas if you can go to the pizzeria and say uh, i want to buy a slice of cheese pizza and you look at the cheese pizza and if i was saying is this pizza i would want to consume then you could <laughs> buy larger quantities of it. so right sell pizza by the slice take the fundamental pizza unit like let's say a cheese pizza and and consume it and if it's good then you can go for more advanced toppings okay uh let's see we have <laughs> uh back to the more astronomy based topics sure we have nestle 20 asking uh fo or saying and asking uh photons are their own antiparticle why don't they destroy each other and why is it the only particle who is its own antiparticle and well i actually don't know there actually are other particles that maybe it's own antiparticle one of the questions is is a neutrino its own antiparticle and it destroy itself. Or in the case of photons, it's just, it's just, it's, it is a, it is a um, carrier of the electromagnetic field. So it's not really a, a, a matter particle. So, but photons can, 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 can collide and not each other. And guess what they do? They form particles. So oh, if, you have, if you have two really energetic photons and they interact and they have enough energy to create a particle, then you get matter. So now the problem is if you get two very weak photons, like we have the light, uh, they'll interact, but there's no particle light enough for them to, to form. So right. you need really energetic photons that interact to create matter. But that's that E equals M squared thing again. Okay. Um, <clears throat> we also have from Taddy Bogle, or is, I'm going to go with Bogle. It might be Bogle. I'm not really sure. Taddy, let me know in the chat. Uh, is it possible that dark matter exists in a dimension outside the ones we can detect? Well, uh, that's a general question of, of are there more dimensions than are obvious to us? And and I guess you have to come back and say, well, semantic, what do you mean by dimensions? Well, um, the common thing you say when you major something about, uh, you say, you know, uh, where something is, you talk about effectively three Final axes of height, width, and depth, right? It's it's X, Y, and Z if you're doing the polar coordinates. Um, you know, up, down, left, right, forward, backwards. Um, but most of the time when you talk about if you talk about meeting someone, you don't sit there and say, We will meet at the corner of third and elm. You say, We're gonna meet at the corner of third and elm at uh eleven o'clock. Right. Today. So you introduce a another uh, a dimension, if you will, called time. So commonly when you talk about interactions, you need to talk about where and when. That's that business about now, right? When I talk about now, um, you might think I'm talking about now in a time spot, but I colloquially when we talk about now, like let's have a podcast now, it means let's you and I meet in cyberspace at the same spot at the same time. Right. So that's why physicists like to talk about um, at least four dimensions, um, three being spatial, up, down, left, right, forward, backwards, and one being time, which is sort of causality. Question is, is that it? Is there, are there potentially more? Um, models of string mechanics talk about having up to 11 dimensions, that the other dimensions are 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 really small and curled in on each other, folded in each other, that they're not really apparent. So it is possible 
that um, dark matter is is some stuff from another dimension that poking its its way into it. Um, you might think, well, what do you mean by another dimension? Well, if if you were a a being in five dimensional space and you look at us folks in four dimensional space, of space and time, you would see the 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 volume of the of the time and space that companies our universe in as a little ball inside yours. You'd, you'd be able to to move in and out of our uh, our space time um, because you have your own dimensions out there. So could something be poking through with other dimensions and showing up? Yeah, this is possible. And um, people are exploring the notion that this is where you get into these things like a multiverse and and right. other interesting um, models that people are beginning to explore. Okay. Great question. Though. <clears throat> uh, let's see. We have from fourth dimensional Jake. Could matter? Or sorry, could dark matter be innumerable numbers of tiny black holes all through the? throughout the universe and i feel like the answer is probably not because the tinier a black hole is the less time it spends hanging out as yeah a, i mean as a thing so so models of black holes uh if stephen hawking was correct and he was right about a lot of things so i would i put bet on him being probably mostly correct the that 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 black holes actually are emit or leak you know, leak stuff. They're, they're not completely those one-way traps that we, we think of them as. Um, that, that is the event horizon where the escape velocity is greater than the speed of light. So you can't have causality. You can't have an effect inside the black hole horizon um, directly impacting something outside. Um, it turns out that Hawking show the physics says that those black holes aren't permanent, that they should glow they should emit radiation that we now call hawking radiation and it turns out that the um the smaller the surface area the brighter that black hole glows so that the really really small micro black holes should have an extremely short um time span before they they go puff in it in a in a burst of energy okay um, so uh, the the chances are that 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 very small those micro black holes have already that might have formed even the moments early after the big bang have already gone poof um the big massive massive black holes that we find commonly in the center of galaxies are ones that are going to last much 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 longer than 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 the uh, the longest lived star so it's kind of a the smaller the black hole, the shorter its life. Um, it's kind of opposite of of, of the, the bigger the star, the shorter its life. It's 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 a weird weird effect. Okay, uh, we have a question. I'm uh, fourth dimensional Jake. Sorry, I'm not entirely sure if I get what you're asking. Uh, right out, it says our system, maybe our system. I'm not sure. Our system has second gen star, so is it about nine billion years the earliest a planet could form with the elements we have? Ah, okay. So, so you're talking about um, the very so so come back to say, well, well, what were the very first stars like? And it turns out that those we think the very first stars were probably massive stars that had very interesting properties. They they these first stars formed out of the the primordial soup that came out from the um, from the event of the Big Bang and would have consisted of mostly hydrogen with a chunk of helium and maybe a trace of lithium. And that would be it, right? That, 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 that those stars would have been what we call poor in other stuff. Uh, astronomers like to call other stuff besides hydrogen, helium, lithium, metals. It's not like they're, they're chunks of, of, of steel there. So sort of a name that, that, that yeah. we give. Actually, mentioned and, that in my next video, I said uh, astronomers aren't always great at naming stuff. Sometimes, <laughs> yeah, I mean that, that that's one of those cases where um, it, it actually it, the term metal metallicity or metals was was intended to be a joke, um, sort of a kind of a joke saying you know it was it was it got a laugh at a at a, at a conference and the, the, and it stuck it kind of stuck as as a thing. It's it's a it's a way 
actually, I think what they're doing is that they're poking, we're poking fun at chemists. You shouldn't because chemists um, are, are, are cool people and they can do things to you if, if, if they get mad. Um, <laughs> they know all the horrible poisons. <laughs> no, no, no. The, the chemists are nice. They're nice people. But, but it's kind of a, it's kind of an inside joke. So the very first stars form from lumps of multi hydrogen they, and, and a little bit of helium. And they probably formed very massive lumps. They were probably massive stars like Betelgeuse or even more mass. And so they existed for, a lot of them existed for a very short period of time and went supernovae. When they went supernovae, they created lots of these heavier elements. But one of the things also that happens with a star like Betelgeuse goes supernovae is it, it turns out a tremendous shockwave. Not only is it, you know, all kinds of material comes out, but that shockwave slams into gas clouds are normally just sitting there fluffy minor own business all of a sudden this this giant goes bam and hits this this gas cloud and compresses it creates lumps lumps are have have gravitational mass right yeah, they're the gravitational uh because of, of the mass there i should say the lumps are chunks of matter their gravitational field starts to do what it starts to collect more stuff around it and so those though that shock super shock wave creates little seeds of what becomes stars and those stars material piles up and they begin to fuse we call that the the the, the second generation of stars those stars go for a time um big ones go faster small ones go shorter but then you say well what happens when they go bang then you get the third generation of stars if our model of how our sun and our solar system formed is reasonably correct, about 4.8 billion years ago, and a little later, 4.8 billion years ago, a second generation star went supernova. Its shockwave pulsed out and went out from space and hit a gas cloud, much like you might see Orion, there's a little gas cloud there, and it created lumps. One of those lumps became our sun. Not only did it, did, it, did, it, did it cause a little compression and started to form the seed that became our sun, but it also, all those heavy elements that were fused in that last moments of the star's uh, supernovae got stuck in our lungs. So that happened 4.8 billion years ago. Well, then another star reasonably nearby uh, 4.7 billion years ago went supernova again. So we had a second bang that, that the shockwave that hit us and because we were already kind of a, a condensed lump that had been condensing for about a hundred million years um it was able to a lot of the 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 good lumpy stuff that came from that supernova were able to stick to us and so we actually got a, a space a second dose of 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 heavy elements and so you and i the the, the iron in your blood the 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 silicon in, 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 in the rocks, the calcium, all the cool chemistry stuff, remember those nice chemists can tell us about, came from two stars. We actually see a bimodal distribution of our, our elements that result. One that came from a supernova 4.8 billion years ago, one from, an, from a second supernova 4.7 billion years ago. Somewhere around 4.65 billion years ago, that lump got dense enough to start to fuse that became our sun. Mm -hmm. And the and the a lot of the heavy material nearby that wasn't that wasn't pushed away from the when the sun switched on all the radiation streaming from that core um stuck around they eventually coagulated to form lumps that became things like mercury venus earth mars okay. the, the rocky planets the the big gas bag the next one out jupiter um is is a result of the hydrogen the relatively light stuff being pushed away. The hydrogen that wasn't in the sun, wasn't gravitationally bound to the sun, the light coming from the sun streaming on popped a bubble. And the, and the size of that bubble is, guess what? Um, the size of orbit of, of what Jupiter is pretty much today. Okay. There is a, there's kind of a, a if you look at a progression, there seems to be, there should be a, a spot we call the asteroid belt where there should have been with another planet. There's another nice orbital resonance spot there. But we don't have a, a, a single large planet in, in the asteroid belt. 
we have a dwarf planet series and a bunch of other smaller stuff around, but there wasn't enough, there were enough stuff to calculate and form a, a planet there. Why? Because the gravitational pull of the of Jupiter, that the edge of that bubble, sucked in a lot of stuff. I mean, even yeah. Mars is a pretty wimpy planet as far as mass goes. It's a fairly light as far as rocky planets go. So Mars is better barely able to form. It didn't have it doesn't have, you know, it's 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 its gravitational field is, is like a third or the fourth of, of Earth. So it doesn't have enough gravity even hold on the atmosphere. Yeah, I so the poor it. the poor planet that could have formed in the asteroid belt just didn't have enough stuff there because Jupiter sucked it away. Okay. Um let's see. According um, to our model, if our model of the universe, uh, how our still right. system form is reason correct, and we have a pretty good idea. Is there are some details we don't know, but all right. So uh, let's see. A few things. One, of course, Chesh, if you want an invite, let me know. That's always the case. Hi, Chesh. Um, uh, yeah, let's come in and say hi. Yeah, I mean, let me know, and I will send you one. I'll. I might have to put a little standby picture up here for just a second while I do it, but yeah, definitely. Uh, so from fourth dimensional Jake on black holes. So we don't see enough Hawking radiation for dark matter to be undetected black holes, no matter the size. And I think it's more that if that were the cause, they just like, they don't last long enough for that to be the cause yeah. in so many different places in the universe yeah. that we and, can see. Sure. And, and black holes, well, the, the stuff inside the event horizon is not glowing bright because because if if Hawking radiation exists it's not a very brilliant stuff what you do see are the effects near the black hole right the the the, the material that's near a black hole that's or around there is in a very should be at a very high temperature state right because it's 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 moving around mash back bashing each other um going all kinds of crazy environments and so you should see not at the black hole but the sur areas surrounding the black hole shave this glow of high energy particles so it's kind of ironic that that, that that black holes actually um the environment around it should be shining in very energy particles what are those particles called x-rays and, and gamma rays so you might have heard or seen the picture of so the of the that that they imaged um, the environment around a the black hole at the center of a galaxy called M87, a nearby galaxy. Um, what they what they actually and you saw this sort of, of reddish thing with this sort of black dot in the middle. That black dot is a shadow of the black hole in the center of the galaxy, and the glowy stuff around it is the material that's orbiting the a, a black hole in in relatively stable orbits under a very tremendous pressures and torching each other and glowing like crazy. So if there were lots of black holes out there, we would see in bringing the X-ray and gamma ray spectrum, the environments near them um, um, glowing. The other thing we would see is that those black holes would be bending light and we'd see light from much more distant um, galaxies and stars being distorted much more than we do today. We can okay. measure the amount of gravitational field and we can look at the amount of mass. Um, and at one time when people were saying to Zwicky, oh, there isn't anything, you know, don't don't worry, it's probably black holes. It turns out, well, no, it's actually not black holes. In fact, dark matter is a lot more, has a lot bigger gravitational field than all the black holes we can account for. Not even close. So okay. it's a good idea, but but it turns out, and, and people were thinking about that maybe in the 1920s or 30s, but we've learned that since then it's like no there's not enough black holes okay now i do think we have a couple um what do you call it? Uh, questions however i'm going to jump down to someone who seems to disagree with you and creation and truth writes in all caps wrong what do you, what do you, you mean? Hey, said creation is truth yes is truth yes that's what that's it, really that's a really interesting i think that's probably a incorrect statement but but if it's a name, maybe it's maybe there's a troll. So, who knows? but what do you think? Wrong. I mean, you're defeated now, right? We should all just pack it up and go home. Well, the problem with creation is not even wrong. See, in science, you know, uh, like remember, I, I was saying, I've been trying to be very correct and saying, if a model of how the solar system forms is reasonably correct, there are. 
there are ways to falsify that model. You, if you observe things that the model claims to be there and it turns out it's not true, then you throw out the model. The problem with creation, the so-called creation thingy, is it's not even wrong. It's not fa falsifiable. Yeah. That's the thing about you know, science, again, that the issue is that science is about questions. Dogma tells you what the answers are and says, believe it or, 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 or bad things happen to you, right? Um, science is about question. In fact, we're, we're, we're in, in, in some religious circles, having doubt is considered to be like, like a crisis. In science, that's, that's, that's excitement. When we discover something we don't understand, we, we embrace that. We, we get actually quite excited because we're about to learn something. The way you can learn something is, is, is one, realize you don't, you might not know, and you study the stuff and gain a better understanding. Whereas in, in sort of dogma, you're told this is the answer. Why? Because it's in someone's book. Well, I think so. So we have a question from Puffalopagus. Uh, Landon, can you shed any light on what is going on with M82-X2, i.e. it's unusually high level of X-ray emissions? So, so M82 um, is, is, is a, first of all, the, the M82 is a, gal is a galaxy. It's actually, it's in the Messier catalog. Um, ah, good old kind Messier. Of Messier. Uh, so Looking for comments and finding everything else. Yeah, he was, and he was basically saying, because um, back in the days, the, the, the telescope weren't that good. And so you'd see fuzzy stuff and say, oh, that might be a comet. And it's like, oh, no, it's not a comet. It's not moving, right? So he ended up with the curve. He had a list of, of, depending on how many is in the list, 110, some odd or, or more. Depending on, there's a debate about, they added stuff onto his list later on. But it turns out Messi is objects of like, that's not a comet. Don't pay attention to it. Ends up becoming some of the most interesting Right. Now there's a look for the Messier objects instead of trying yeah. to just avoid them. Yeah. There's there's another catalog called a Caldwell catalog, and Caldwell collected a set of stuff that Messier missed. And uh, there's some stuff he missed because they were in the southern too far south in the southern hemisphere. And so it is because he just he he, he didn't think it was a comet, um, but it's still cool stuff. Or it was too faint for his telescopes. So um, call the catalog is another set. Anyway, M87, M82 is also known as NGC 3034. Um, now, there's a lot of stuff out there in the universe, and you start running out of cool names like Rigel and Betelgeuse and so forth. Um, now, we call M82 is called the Cigar Galaxy in part because you squint enough. And you have a telescope that's kind of fuzzy, sort of looks sort of like a cigar, some people think. But you kind of run out of names, right? Because there's lots of stuff out there and not very many names. So we started getting at more prosaic things. And NGC uh, is, is uh, 3494. It's a galaxy. And this galaxy is a distance of around 12 million light years. So it means it takes... The time we are now is, is we see light that took 12 and a half million years or 12 million years to reach us. Right. Um, it's a, it's a galaxy that if you, if you have a relatively large binoculars or even a modern sized telescope, you can, you can see it there. It, it's a, it's a very active uh, galaxy. That's what we call a starburst galaxy. It has lots of stuff going on. Um, it has a, a a very unique sort of, of stuff coming out of it. So if you if you look at some of the more detailed, better telescopic periods, you see the stuff coming out of the center. And one of the things we assume is it might have had a a um, a burst of of stars forming, perhaps because it absorbed someone else's uh, absorbed another another galaxy, sort of some dwarf galaxies, and they're interacting and 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 creating what gas clouds sliming each other forming lumps those lumps forming very massive stars massive stars shine for a sh short period of time like Betelgeuse and go bang supernova so you get this burst of supernova activity and all kinds of things out there we have seen you know um, for example there was a, there was a supernova uh, we actually saw a um 
uh, observed a, a, a basically a broad, bright dot showed up in um, this galaxy and, and uh, was observed in our now in um, 21st of January, uh, 2014. And it was essentially um, one of the closer uh, supernovas that have been observed in decades. And um, anyway, this, this center of this galaxy is quite active. There are uh, things called micro quasars, these, these environments where you have this very energetic particle reaction going on there. So when you look at it in the, in the, particularly in the X-ray, right? There's a, there's a te X-ray telescope that is above your atmosphere because our atmosphere fortunately shields us from a lot of the X-rays like that come from the sun. But if you get a telescope outside of our atmosphere that's, that's able to image X-rays, you find that MA2 is actually quite bright. And um, there is a, there's actually a, a pretty big glow centered around and, and, and um, centered around the, the, the center of this thing. And, and, and we, but you see, if you see the, the normal disc of a galaxy, because M82 is kind of, it's kind of edge on, um, from the X-ray, you see glowing stuff coming out of the center going on in his lobes, which um, correspond with some other uh, tentacles of, of stuff we see in radio waves. Okay. So it's a very active galaxy, and um, it has a lot of bursts of very act active in X-rays. It's very active in radio. It's very active in infrared. Um, it's got all kinds of stuff. It's going on. It's a pretty. It's a. It's. Um, there. There are. If you look at the star formation rate of M eighty two, it's ten times the rate of stars forming in our galaxy. Wow, that's a lot. And also, it means that 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 it's it has lots of massive stars being formed and going bang. So it has a, it's, it has prodigious uh, rate of, um, of, of, uh, you know, supernovas going on. It also has a, uh, we've detected it has a central mass hole, a black central massive black hole around 30 million times the mass of our, of our sun. And, and it's, how does yeah. that compare to the Milky Way's central black hole? It's 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 comparable with our 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 SARS. I mean, it's not it's not a heavyweight like like what's going on uh, like in M eighty seven, but it is a um, it 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 does it does have a um, a lot of interactions down near its core, and it creates jets that kind of come on either side of the the galaxy, and so some of the X rays of of the of the jets coming out of the galaxy. Are from the environment near that intermediate, in in inside that that intermediate black hole, um, and uh, so it, it's it's a lot of crazy stuff going on in there. That's that's it, it's a fun environment. It's a very energetic, high density environment, um, and it's something that people are studying. It's relatively nearby. I mean, uh, in terms of the. Uh, in terms of, of distance, I mean, 11, 12 million light years is relatively nearby. And um, it's a it's a fun galaxy to look at. You should, in a small telescope, it's, about, it's a little bit fainter than Neptune, okay. uh, but but it still is quite reachable for, for stuff. It has, um, um, by the way, so, so when Messier looked at it, he already saw the central core. If you get a big enough telescope, you start to see some of the, some of the, 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 the part of the galaxy that's not in the core it's it's nearly edge on right it's not it's okay. not a it's not a an open face like a like a pizza pie it's 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 right. more on the side and so the easiest spot to see is the core of the center but when you get to get more exposure you start to see the the arms coming out and you get more exposure you start to see stuff coming sideways and when you look at it in in radio waves or x-ray so far you find all kinds of crazy that's going on it's it's a it's a it's a happening neighborhood. Um, they're having a star party out there. Okay. For some reason, my avatar disappeared. I don't know why, so I'm not going to super worry about it. Especially since we're we're closing in on, on, on the home stretch for this. So, um, we have our very own Kent Hoven fan currently in the audience. And he has said, explain the Big Bang. And I'm going to go ahead and say that that's probably a bit of a big task for right now. But <clears throat> current ideas about the Big Bang and, uh, you know, the 
course of the cosmos through time from, you know, the earliest moments that we can really talk about. I think that could actually be a pretty interesting subject for a future talk between you and I. Yeah. You think so that the, could be a next yeah, one? The, big, the, the big Bang is a, is a model um, about uh, you know the early universe and and the how the universe um, you know changed from that early state to its current state. Um, one of the things that the Big Bang model does not do is explain the 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 situation prior to the Big Bang. And there's various models that say either that time and space was created in the Big Bang. Or that, or it came to being in the Big Bang. That 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 um, the Big Bang process also um, established established time. There's also a model talking about the, the the multiverse and so forth. But most of the stuff that that the Big Bang models focus on is 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 what happened from that early universe going forward. Right. Um, now, uh, if 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 what I hear is happening with this notion of uh, uh, creation is truth. Um, the the Big Bang model is falsifiable, right? It, it makes predictions that have it has made a number of predictions that have turned out to be remarkably uh, accurate in terms of observation. And there are things that states that if we observe something which is contrary to the model, the model is falsified and it's tossed out. Right. Now, this is different than dogma, which says we'll take some Babylonian plagiarized thing, write it down in a couple of different ways, call di dictate that that's called truth, and tell you to you that's the dogma. And if you disagree, you're you're a bad person. That's hard to do science that way. So so um, it is. That's why it. you get things like. The talk that I'm going over in my current video series, which is yeah, now, yeah, and and I have to say, 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 you know, talking about you know people saying it's rude, you know, I think it's actually um, rude to kind of of, of ignore stuff. I, by the way, I if 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 you want to deal with looking at a scholarly description of some of those texts, um, you should check out a group called Milwaukee Atheists. Every Sunday, they actually read. Get this, they actually read that the that, that book called the Bible in various sources. And if you start actually reading that thing, if you read what that dogma is, you sit there and say, Wow, okay, you know. So, so I prefer to stick to 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 reality and, and observable as I, I prefer the scientific process with falsifiable uh, processes. Um, and so uh, that's why you you I, I, I you hear me making statements like if this model is reasonably correct then da da da. Now, um, in the case of like the the Big Bang process, there were things we're learning about right the the the, the early universe and uh, the model is being refined. There 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 it's not a complete understanding of everything. Um, we're not telling you this is what it is. We're saying. The data, the science, the scientific method leads us to, 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 to these conclusions. And we develop models that we can then try to falsify and, 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 and toss out. Rather than to say someone eventually recorded through various translations someone else's explanation for how uh, the universe was sneezed out of a turtle's nose or whatever your, 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 your myth is declaring that to be truth and saying if you don't believe in that truth you're a bad person so that this is about uh you know you're rude i think that's rude i think it's rude to sit there and say unless you believe my mythology you are a bad person that seems to be pretty rude so i prefer to stick to observations the scientific process falsifiability because unfortunately uh i would say creation is truth um, the, your problem is you're not even wrong. Well, in my opinion. And all I have to add is that um, I have, as far as the channel is concerned, no official stance on any of your beliefs that don't contradict the science. Once your belief does contradict the science, though, then there's another issue. Yeah. 
So, so but, but there's, 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 there's a lot more fun things in reality. Like, like again, that, that question about M82, um, study that galaxy. There's a lot of really interesting stuff happening, right? The fact, for example, we've learned that the, um, the starburst rate um, probably started around four to six million years ago, given the, the emissions coming from the starburst area. So something happened in the near the core of that galaxy to drive up the star formation rate much higher than average um, several million years ago. And um, it's, it's creating a very interesting environment. So nice thing about it is that you can see the effects of supernovae because it's got a lot of it going on in there. And um, you get a lot of studies of stuff rather than having to wait around our galaxy to say, well, the Betelgeuse is going to go, we'll wait under 100,000 years. I mean, um, right. on average in our galaxy, a supernova is close enough for you to see it visibly in the sky, but once every 400 years. Okay. Now, here's, here's an example about truth, right? Um, in 1054, a star went supernova in, 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 and created what we call the Crab Nebula. In fact, it was Messier's first object, M1. And that supernovae was a bright star that showed up in the sky. It was actually bright enough to be seen in the daytime. Right. It was, again, like, like, because it was bright enough to be seen in the daytime. And, and people recorded of seeing it, you know, a, as a brilliant star. And actually, were, there was actually was a, a couple of weeks where people recorded it, where you could actually see it as a dot in, in, the, in the daytime. Now, that was a big thing. That was a big event. And in fact, we have civilizations that record this stuff. Well, guess what was happening here? Let's go to happening in, in places in Europe that was dominated by a particular sect, a religious organization putting up dogma. Um, at that time, the person who claimed to be divine by point of my God to speak on behalf of God said that the heavens are are, 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 are the heavens, right? They're, They're God, unchanging. Mm, unchanging thing. And that's, that thing where they're, that's the devil or that's the whatever, you know, that's being deceiving you. Um, don't look at it. Don't study it. And in fact, there was a sort of, of a, don't pay attention to that thing because the heavens are supposed to be, you know, God's handiwork and not changing. Now, other civilizations record the stuff we see in our directors in the Polynesians. We see it in uh, places of Africa. We see it in, in Asia. And we can look at a telescope and see the fuzz. We can see the rate and we can get data and guess what? 1054. So the all these calendar records of these other civilizations saw it, but people professing dogma said, no, 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 no. That's not truth, right? Uh, again, that same group of that same cult was the people that said to Galileo, you are not authorized to doubt and test the statements of the church. All right. Understand, by the way, understand that 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 that, that organization has never pardoned Galileo. They said they were regretted the 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 unpowerful fear of the trial was, but they convicted Galileo because he dared test the statements of the church. Tisk, 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 tisk. All right, so we're coming Sorry. in on the last <laughs> few minutes you here. me there. <laughs> I know. We're coming in on the last few minutes. Uh, creation is truth. If you're still here and you do actually want to debate, there is a uh, video on my channel called Debate Me. Watch it, and if you can agree to have a debate within the framework that is described there, which I think is a pretty fair one, then email me. And uh, <clears throat> like it says in the video, put debate in big capital letters in the uh, the subject line. All right. Now we're going to try and speed through questions. So we have to try to give fairly quick. Let's do the rapid. Uh, All right. Uh, and yeah. also, so we're ended in about 11 minutes. And we if we do let's get a super do... chat, that'll come to the front of the page. So if you want to get a I'll see if I can do yourself in like a few seconds uh, or a, a sentence. Okay. Fine. And they may be incomplete, but but give me give me a turn. All right, fourth dimensional Jake. If you had an isolated spiral ga galaxy that had a ring outside, if it aligned on the plane with an even gravitational pull, would it speed up or slow down the outer stars? The ring know. outside of the spiral galaxy would 
would cause the material on the inside to spin faster, I believe. Okay. Um, and I'm trying to read through because there a lot came in, and I don't know how much of it is actually questions. I mentioned it because 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 the dark one of the things the dark matter gravitational field allows for galaxies to spin faster than normally would. Um, Dark Knight Apologetics points out that a priest, and specifically a Jesuit priest, was the first person to propose the Big Bang theory, and that's true. Cool. And I don't think that I don't think that anyone. Certainly not me. I don't think Landon is arguing that people of numerous religions can't make valuable, very valuable contributions to yeah. science. And I, the question yes. is, when you start letting things that you think you're supposed to believe that contradict the evidence take over, then you're going to start yeah. doing I mean, bad science. Even that, 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 that the Catholic Church has its own um, observatory called the Vatican Observatory. I've been... I've been there. So they, and, and there have been a number of, of, uh, people that very, very committed to the Catholic church priests that are, that have contributed a lot of stuff. Yeah. Um, but Excellent. you know, ask, ask, ask the Vatican about what happened to Giordano Bruno, a, a really interesting person had some really interesting ideas that unfortunately were ahead of its time. And the church had ability to burn people at the stake. And so he was off. actually on uh, Mount Lemon outside of uh, Arizona, not that long ago. And one of the um, one of the telescopes there is actually owned by the Vatican. Yep. Okay. Other other questions. Uh, let's see. Uh, do, do, do. I bet we have more of. Oh, that wasn't for you. That was for Creation is Truth because apparently he either hates the audience or me, and I also want to know why my right arm is being funny. Mm. Doesn't, doesn't really I, I think maybe maybe it's because you're you've you've got there's maybe there's like a micro black hole down there and you know what it is i think it's just a bat my batter my arms are battery operated and i think the battery is just dead ah it's possible as well that 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 you're seeing a specific spaghettification right <laughs> maybe there's <laughs> well like... i can do funny things like i can i can drag it around so it mm. just kind of goes back to where it was see mm. anyway uh let's see uh do, do, do. facetime is odd thing I'm not actually seeing too many more questions. So I think uh, we can Let's end see. with some plugs. So uh, I will quickly plug tomorrow. I have a, uh, a video premiere at 5 p.m. Pacific, 8% pre 8 p.m. Eastern. You do the math on all the other time zones yourself. <laughs> yep. um, then come Wednesday... I have a hangout scheduled with Cheshire Vic and Erica from Gutsick Gibbon. If you don't know who either of these two ladies are, you need to check them out. Um, Cheshire Vic has been doing, she has a lot of art content on her channel and she's start, been starting to do some live interviews and uh, breakdowns of some yeah. current events that have been happening in the community. And they've been excellent. Um, Erica is a primatology master's student. And she has been doing some great content on uh, primate evolution, evolution in general, the mass extinctions over the course of Earth's history. Um, she had yeah. a she had a very good debate with both Standing for Truth and Kent Hovind. And mm -hmm. uh, she has been on my channel once before. And there is a video coming up on her channel. I'm not sure when that will also feature me. So, uh, yeah, tune in for that on Wednesday. Um, and hey, creation is truth. Dislike and tell me why in the comments because that's engagement. Yeah. Every time um, you dislike a video, YouTube promotes it. So, Landon, yeah. is there anything you would like to uh, to plug? Well, a couple of, of, of groups out there. Uh, certainly, I would invite creation is truth to uh, check out Milwaukee Atheists. Um, they have an atheist Sunday school where they read the Bible. They're also reading uh, uh, the Apocrypha on Fridays. And they do very uh, check check out their uh, Patreon and some of their um, and some of the videos they've done. They just did a uh, a, a thing on the council, uh, very sort of early church councils, and a lot of really good scholarly work regarding uh, Christianity. Um, another group I would recommend you check out is In Time. Uh, uh, there there are a couple of folks there that do really interesting. Um, uh, commentary. They have two people who are, I wouldn't say polar opposites, but they have a unique ability. 
they're able to sometimes admit when they found they're wrong or that they've been convinced otherwise. They're able to change their mind. You can actually have intelligent conversations where you start with different positions and you come to the middle. Um, well, that's amazing. It's, it's an amazing <laughs> set. And they're they're they have they have disagreements, but they have intelligent discussions and disagreements. So check out End Time. A uh, good friend of mine, Pimp Monk, as a as a, uh, a comedian, uh, really brilliant uh, improv guy. You should check out his channel um, as well. Um, and of course, you should check out this channel and and subscribe and click the like bell and like and <laughs> the bell do all and, the YouTube things. And I assume you, I assume you also have you also have he has a Patreon. Right. Because you have a Patreon. Um, so I actually have a Patreon, a merch store, and an Amazon wish list. If you'd like to support the channel, all of those are great options. The Patreon tiers start at one dollar and they go up. Um, and every month, assuming that there's a change, which there has been every month since I started it, I update my end credits to make sure that everything is yeah. set so that all my uh patrons at five dollars or above are in the credits, and all of them are twenty dollars or above are Named yeah. out loud by me as supporters, and um, so far the merch is all from Teespring, and I've been extremely happy with uh, how it's looking. Every yeah, good, good merch. I mean, it really is. It just, and it's, folks, it's important if you like this content, or if you dislike this content, um, support it because this is how this is how you know the 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 thing like science is work. You have patrons who would encourage scientists to ask questions, right? And and I think. Dapper uh, is a good person to ask lots of questions. His crowd also asks lots of really great questions. Oh, yeah. We have such a great audience, don't we, Landon? Absolutely. And that's, again, that's a part of the scientific method is to, to is, is science is about questions and values questions over answers, right? Yeah. That's a, I that's gotta a say, fun we, thing. We have a very curious and very intelligent audience on this and really all of my live streams and my premieres. And yeah, I am very, very happy that. Yeah. We get mostly uh, extremely intelligent people, and then we get some people who just like to scream in the comments for everyone to laugh no. at. So that, that, you know. that's fun. And say I don't know. If, I don't know if it's it's, it's so. You say so. I don't. You know. I don't have my own channel. Like I usually um, appear on guests of, of fine shows like this one. But if you could also somehow, I don't know if it, do you, if you have uh, comments or little add-on things for a show. If you could put a link to Milwaukee Atheists and End Time and to Pimp Monk. Yeah, um, I'll tell you what. Um, if anyone, if any of my um mods can get those, uh, then that would be great, and put them in the chat. And also, um, if you could send those to me, like just to hit, hit hit my like Twitter DMs or something, and I can add them after the fact to the description of this video. So anyone who watches it after will have that available to them right in the uh, description. Um, so as far Thanks as again for the great audience, great questions. Yeah. Um. There is, um, there's a quick question that I'll answer. Sure. Uh, why don't I show my face? It's primarily, well, first, I mean, I do, I'm, I'm the Dapper Dino. You see it all over the place. But the actual answer is, um, it's a matter of branding. I don't, this channel isn't about me as a person. It's not about my views on religion or theology or metaphysics. Just about science and good science. And anything that distracts from that, I don't really talk about it on my own. And I mean, I've had people who are Christians, not Christians, uh, people who have not bothered to answer on. So I'm pretty open to having yeah. all sorts of points of view on. I don't give mine. And I also don't put my face out there because uh, it's it's just not relevant. And perhaps at some time that will change. I don't know. Tell you what, hey, get me yeah. to 100,000 subscribers. I'll put my real face out there. There you go. That's a that's a uh, subscribe so we can see the face that is launched a thousand dinos. Of course, if it's actually a dinosaur, don't be disappointed. <laughs> and, okay. And and of course, yes. And and uh, by the way, somebody asked about uh, uh, simulations. There are some good uh, simulation software out there uh, for that. The kind of simulations I tend to run. You know, we have a large hundred thousand core cluster. We do computational simulations of stuff. <sighs> trying to build models to see if we can make sense of observations of some of these extreme conditions. And, uh, but we also do a simulation. So we did a simulation of, of Jupiter in the orbits of its four biggest moons. 
um, and showed some instability over a long period of time, which ended up being matched by observation. So um, that's kind of interesting thing. So um, simulations coming for the simulations I do are, are sort of boring numerical stuff, but I, I believe, isn't there, isn't there um, a, a simulation that you could change like the, the so-called laws of physics or change speed of light and see what wacky things happen. Isn't there a, I can cause stars to collide and sure. all kinds of So I know that, um, I think you, universe sandbox might yes, be sandbox. you can do that. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if sandbox can give you a, a big bang simulation. I think you could simulate conditions very short, actually after the big bang and see wacky things happening. This avatar is pretty nice. Thanks, Duke. Um, so I think with that, we are probably going to head out. It is just at about the one hour, or sorry, two hour marks. Uh, there will be a slight delay. I have to do a tiny bit of editing on this video before it actually goes up publicly. Like I said, anyone who wants to debate, please check out the debate me video. And if you think that that are those are acceptable terms, then yeah. hey, send me an email, and chances are we can set up a debate. Uh, that is it for me. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you very much. Bye, everybody. And, and folks, keep asking questions.